Hey everybody, uh, today we're going to be going through 9.3 set of notes, which is solved uh, using square roots. So we're going to be utilizing the skills from 9.1, which I know for a lot of us was a struggle, because the, the section from 9.1 was talking about everything radical, so not just square roots, but also cube roots. But for the people who I had talked to, who have sent me stuff, or have given feedback to, or have had Google Meets, um, I've kind of emphasized the fact that really as long as you're comfortable and, and competent with square roots, then you'll be fine for Algebra 1. In Algebra 2, we go through and cover cube roots and higher level radicals and stuff like that. Um, but for Algebra 1 purposes, not something we really have to worry about. So today, I'll be showing you how we'll use those. So after today, as long as you're comfortable working with square roots, um, that's really what I want you guys to take away from what 9.1 was. Um, so we'll use those today. Um, I am going to go through stuff a little bit quickly. I, I'm going to, like, I'll explain everything, obviously. Um, but since you guys have this on video, you can feel free to pause it if you, if I went through stuff too quickly, rewind it, watch, watch it multiple times until it makes sense. And obviously, if there's anything you're still confused on after watching the video a couple of times, slowing it down, going back and rewatching it, reach out, let me know. We can schedule something uh, through Google Meet, or we can just talk through email or through Remind as well. Okay, so starting with box one, a square root. Um, now, we talked about uh, simplifying square roots um, and simplifying cube roots, but technically, something we didn't address is that uh, a positive number has two square roots. Two things that if I squared them would give me that number underneath my radical. So if I wanted to evaluate the square root of 9, well, the obvious answer for all of us would be a positive 3, because 3 times 3, 3 squared, is 9. But we also have this option that's not as obvious to most of us uh, in negative 3. We could take negative 3 and square it, multiply it times itself, and we would also get 9. So because 3 squared equals 9 and negative 3 squared also equals 9. That's where we get those two solutions from. So something we'll be doing um, today where we're going through and solving using these square roots, we're going to add a plus or minus symbol in order to kind of take into account both the positive and negative versions of those answers. So we're still going to be simplifying it like we did on Monday, or sorry, last week, which I think was actually last week. Was it last week, Monday? Sure. Um, anyway, so when we're going through and solving equations with squared variables, we need to get both of those answers. And our process for how we solve an equation that has a squared variable in it is pretty much going to be the same as solving any other equation that we've solved. We're trying to isolate my variable. I'm trying to get my x by all, all the way by itself. And in the case of it being squared, we're going to have to undo that square in order to get my variable totally all the way isolated by itself. So in our steps here, we're going to start, step one is always going to be, just like in another, any other equation, we're going to isolate the squared term. So sometimes, not in this problem, but it, sometimes you'll have other things happening in your equation where, like in this case, x squared is my squared term. There's other stuff attached to it or other things happening to it. So my first step is always going to be getting it by itself. In this case, step one is already done for us based on the problem. Step two, once we have that squared term by itself, in order to cancel it out, the opposite of squaring something, the inverse of squaring something, would be taking its square root. Just like the multiplication is the inverse of division, addition is the inverse of subtraction, and vice versa, I'm just going to do that inverse operation. So here for step two, I'm going to take the square root... of both sides. And again, we have to do both sides just like with anything else we do in our equation. If I do something to the left side, I have to do something to the right side. Now I'm going to write this as a separate thing. I would usually just 
write the square root above the two of them, but just to emphasize my different steps. So here I'm just, step two is actually just taking the square root of both sides. So my square and my square root cancel each other out. I'm left with just x on the left side. And now I've got my square root of 81 on the right side. So the final step, the fourth and final step, is going to be... Ooh, where did you go and run off to? The fourth and final step is going to be to simplify. So this is where our skills from last week came into play from 9.1, where we're trying to simplify my square root. Here, in this case, it is just a whole number, because 9 is the square root of 81, right? Because 9 squared is 81. But we also have to take into account that net negative as well. Now, there's an easy way of writing this, a little symbol in here that that just means that we have both the positive and the negative answer for what we're dealing with. That symbol right there is called the plus or minus symbol. And that really just means that I have both the positive and negative value as a solution. So here, both positive and negative 9 are my two answers. And that's basically it. Um, we're going to do a couple of practice problems for box 2 that look pretty similar to this, and then we'll start moving into some different stuff for boxes 3 and 4. So in box 2, now we do have something to do for part 1. Part 1, remember, sorry, step 1 was to isolate my, my squared term. So here I'm going to start just like any other equation solving. I'm going to get everything else away from my variable. So I'm going to start by adding 27 on both sides. That gives me 3x squared equals 27. I'll divide by 3, giving me x squared equals 9. Step 2, square root both sides. Step 3, simplify. In this case, the square root of 9 is 3, so I have plus or minus 3 for my solution. For box number, sorry, number 3 in box 2, same basic setup. I'm going to start with step 1, which is isolating my squared term. That ends up being positive 5 there. I divide by negative 5 to get my x squared all by itself, and I get negative 1. Step 2, take the square to both sides. Step 3, get my answer. So I'll have x equals plus or minus is pretty much going to be default for any equation that you're solving. And now we just have to try and figure out underneath my radical, what's, what's the square root of negative 1? Which in this case is an issue, because as we saw on nine, in 9.1, we could have negative numbers underneath my cube root, but square root of negative numbers are not a possibility for us. We can't have any number times itself to be a negative, because two positives make a positive, two negatives make a positive when they get multiplied together. So in this case, if you ever end up with something where you're taking the square root of a negative number, it is simply no real solution. There is no real number that we could square to give us negative 1. Now, fun little preview, in Algebra 2, we actually cover how we can handle those. We talk about non-real numbers in Algebra 2, but that is, for those doubling up, a fun adventure for next year. For those in the regular track, buckle up for junior year. All right, box three. Um, so this is where it starts to get a little bit more complicated because uh, obviously here my squared term, the thing that makes this problem messy is that my squared term is not just the single variable. It is uh, a whole parenthesis in this case. But my, st my steps are still going to be the same. I'm still going to start with step one in isolating my squared term, which in this case is actually already done. The thing that is squared in this problem is my parenthesis, x minus one, and that's already by itself. So that tells us that we actually get to jump right to step two, which is taking the square root of both sides. So in this case, the left side, my square and my square root cancel each other out. I'm left with x minus one. 
And on the right side, the square root of 25 is plus or minus 5. Because again, 5 squared is 25. I got to do that plus or minus in order to account for both of those two options. Now, this one behaves very, very similar to how we solved back way, way back at the beginning of the school year with our absolute values. Here, we're going to split this off, and my plus or minus symbol really means I have two different equations here. I have this equation once, where it's x minus 1 equals that positive 5, and I also have this x minus 1 equaling the negative 5. And that's where my two solutions come from. This one, you'll actually get two completely different answers. So I add one over here, and I get my first option as positive 6. Here I add 1 on both sides, and I get negative 4 as my other solution. So those are my two answers there. A little bit different. Uh, number 5 here, we do have something to do with step 1. Um, with isolating my squared term, here I'm going to divide by 4 on both sides. And this one, quite a bit uglier. I've got x minus 3 parentheses squared equals 9 over 4. So now that my squared term is isolated, I'm going to take the square root of both sides. Those cancel each other out. Uh, the square root of a fraction... Again, that was box 2 for 9.1. I can split this up into the square root of 9 over the square root of 4. So I end up with x minus 3 equals, that plus or minus is still there, uh, 3 over 2. Because 3 squared is 9, 2 squared is 4. And then I'm going to do the same thing as the previous problem. I'm going to split this off into my two separate problems x minus 3 equals 3 halves, x plus 3 equals 3 halves. And actually, I'm going to rewrite this just for ease sake. 3 over 2 is 1.5, because most of you would probably do that anyway. It's easier to add with a decimal than a fraction for quite a bit of you. So here, when I add 3 on both sides... I get positive four and a half. When I subtract three from both sides, I get negative two and a half. Sorry, negative one and a half. Did I not switch? I did not. Why did I switch that? Sorry. I realized I made a bonehead mistake here. I switched the wrong symbol here. So if you didn't catch that, hopefully you did, and I just didn't until just now. Um, my x minus 3 should be staying the same both times. Here, this should have been a negative 1.5, because my plus or minus 3 over 2 is the thing that's switching. So on the left one, I've got the positive 3 over 2, which is positive 1.5. On the right side, I should have negative 1.5, which I still add 3 to it, and I should get positive 1.5. Sorry for that confusion. But those would be my two solutions, four and a half and one and a half. All right, so uh, for the last one, for the last box here, we're approximating solutions, which you wouldn't know that until really you get towards the end of the problem, because the only difference here is that you're not going to end up with a nice pretty number. So still the same process. I'm still going to start by isolating my squared term. So I'm adding 13 here on both sides. That gives me 4x squared equals 28. I'll divide by 4 on both sides. x squared equals 7. So then step 2, take the square root of both sides. And I get x equals plus or minus. There's no perfect number for the square root of 7. So you could leave it as just the square root of some, uh, plus or minus the square root of 7 if you wanted to. Or you'd have to use your calculator here. This is what why I'm, I call this approximating solutions. Um, just go on your calculator, take the square root of 7, round it to two decimal places. So here, plus or minus the square root of 7 is the exact answer. If you wanted a decimal approximation, plus or minus 2.5.
2.65. And again, that's just plugging into your calculator. Square to 7. Same thing for the last one. Here I'm going to... Step one, isolate my variable. X squared equals 11. Step two, square to both sides. Step three, simplify. So I can either leave this as plus or minus the square root of 11, or I could use my calculator to approximate that it is 3.32. And again, that's rounding to two decimal places. So it depends whether you need to do that or not. Really depends on what the instructions are. If it just uh, if it just asks you to solve the equation, you could leave it in either of those two. If it asks you to solve the equation and round your answer to the nearest hundredth, that would be rounding the nearest two decimal places. Um, if it doesn't specify, it's up to you. If you would prefer using a calculator, um, that's fine. The one benefit to doing that, um, to using the decimal answer. If you had something that you left in, in what, I, what we call radical form, so that first one, square root of 11, if you had something in that form that could simplify, let's say, I'm just kind of going off script here, let's just say you ended up with something like x squared equals 32, and you went ahead and took the square root of both sides, you couldn't leave that as x equals plus or minus the square root of 32 because the square root of 32 simplifies using the skills we, we looked at on 9.1. That should break down into 16 times 2. All right, so that would be the square root of 16 times the square root of 2. So you should leave this as either plus or minus 4 root 2 or use that decimal approximation to find whatever that is. The square root of 32 should be somewhere between 5 and 6. So that's the benefit of using a decimal. If you just go ahead and just take that square root and put it as a decimal approximation, you don't have to worry about whether or not you could or can't simplify it. So if you're going to choose one of them, I guess go ahead with that. Um, but it is good for us to be able to work with those other skills as well. Uh, that's it for the video. Um, again, like I said earlier, if you were confused, if I went too quickly through stuff, feel free to watch it over again. You guys can always play in the, like, go around, go into the playback settings on YouTube, and you can slow it down to different speeds if I'm talking just way too quickly, um, and it's been a while since you've had to keep up with me. Um, go ahead and do that. Uh, homework is down there at the bottom, page 501, number 4 through 32, just the evens. As always... If you're confused, if you're getting frustrated and feel completely lost, it's still not too late. Um, don't feel like just because you haven't been doing stuff so far that you shouldn't start now. There's still enough time to get everything made up and still be okay for the semester. Don't keep pushing stuff off because it's going to get to the point where if you have so many incomplete assignments, stuff that you're missing, you're going to have to take this class over again next, ne next semester with me. Or sorry, not next semester, next spring with me. So it's better for you to just get your work in now, ask me questions, get that stuff caught up, and then just be on to geometry next year and not have to worry about me again until your junior year with Oliver 2. So um, if you're going to have any questions, reach out, let me know. I'll talk to you guys later.